have never done so. This is a connect card, right? Why do we have these? So you can fill it out and so we can connect. Yes, absolutely. Praise God. Give yourselves a round of applause. That was good. Yes, so, so that we can connect with you. It's got some boxes over here you can check, prayer requests, a new membership, whatever the case may be. If you have not yet, please fill this out. In lieu of your offering, stick it in the box in the back and we will definitely connect with you. A couple things this morning. Um, we uh, have a celebration today and it's going to be a kind of a congratulation celebration for somebody here in our congregation Congratulations, celebration, congregation. I didn't plan that, just so you know. <clears throat> um, Brian Benitsky. Brian, would you stand up for us, please? Give him a hand of, give Brian a round of applause. <clears throat> As you're going to see, Brian served on this side, and my whole life was on the other side. Um, so there will be cake and stuff after the service. 22 years of service. Thank you for your service. And on top of all that, we have a birthday. It may be more than one, but I know of one. You see those balloons back there? Come on. Anyway, today is Jackie's birthday. So <clears throat> as you know, as we do here, we're going to go ahead and we're going to sing happy birthday to Jackie. So one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jackie. Happy birthday to you. Amen. <clears throat> and many more, Lord willing. Also, do not forget, please, the Great Reset Conference. This thing is filling up fast, really fast. This is going to be on October 16th and 17th, Saturday and Sunday. This will be in lieu of our Sunday service, and unfortunately, uh, regardless of how long you've been coming here for, if you do not sign up and have a ticket, we will not be able to let you in, okay? It's not unfair. There's people coming from all over the world, Lord willing. Again, it's our time as the church to be the church and to be a witness to the rest of the world of the church. Please sign up for this. It is going very fast. <clears throat> so welcome to Sunrise Bible Church. Not only do we want to welcome you all here today, as, core of, as always, we want to welcome our online family, uh, everybody in particular who streams online, who's faithful, and who's getting encouraged by the ministries here. Let's go ahead and on one, two, three, howdy ho, online family. One, two, three. Howdy ho, online family. That was good. That was good. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> Thank you for streaming in. Uh, we're grateful for you and, uh, uh, you know, just streaming in. So, we, we encourage you to get plugged in. There's three ways on Facebook. Billy Crone, Get a Life Media, just look for those on Facebook. You can get plugged in. Three ways on YouTube. Again, just look for Billy Crone. You'll find it. There is the Twitter account. Look for Billy Crone. Again, there's the Roku, Amazon Fire Stick. There's the Billy Crone app. You can download it to your device, and you have it all right there. And, of course, if you're missing anything, where do you go? I said, if you're missing anything, where do you go? Getalifemedia.com. That's right. Getalifemedia.com. Amen. Praise God for that. There's 10 years worth of stuff. If you're serious about your walk with Christ and it's on your heart, you need to learn more and grow more in your walk with Christ, you will find the resources there to grow. Stuff. Also, we encourage you, get the hard copies. Get them. Download them. Burn them and give them out. We make it so easy in these days to get the gospel out there. Every one of them has the gospel message at the end of it. Get them out any way we can to share the gospel with the lost and dying world here and around us, right? Amen? Amen. All right, so this morning, we're going to go ahead and take an offering as well. If you want to here, uh, you can pop it in the boxes at the back there. <clears throat> and if you're online and you want to give to the ministries here and you want to help us out, we really appreciate it, obviously, uh, to help the gospel, get the gospel out there. You can do so by going to the appropriate website. On the website, there's a click donate option. There's an address that you can mail it to the appropriate address. And then also now, as I'm speaking, there should be a texting option popping up on the screen. We're going to go ahead and we're going to pray for our offering and pray for today's study. And then we're going to go ahead and get started. Are you guys ready? Yes. All right, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, as always, we're so grateful and thankful for your amazing grace, God, that you did what only you could do 
and save miserable wretches like us, God. We need to be looking to you. We need to always remember, always remember from what we were saved, God, to be grateful for where we saved to and for now, God. We're not saved just for fun, God. We're saved to serve you. We're saved for a better place. We thank you for such amazing grace. Oh, grace, how sweet the sound. We pray this morning, God, for the offering. <clears throat> we ask that you would bless the gift, bless the giver, that you would use it in a mighty way to help us get the gospel out here and around the world, God, and that we would be busy uh, serving you in everything we do. We pray, pray for the message today, Lord. Uh, God, would you please use it in a mighty way, encourage us by it, and help us to grow deeper in our walk with you. Each and every day as we face the day, understanding what it was once like, God, for a wretch like us, that we would come face to face with your amazing grace. Oh, how sweet the sound. Thank you, Jesus. Please uh, bless this study, Lord. We really, truly need to hear from you. So we pray that as well. All this we pray in Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. That's right. Amen. <clears throat> Psalm 66, 16 says, come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell of what he has done for my soul, what he has done for my soul. <clears throat> Today, I'm going to be sharing with you all my personal testimony. That is the story of how God saved a wretch like me, what God saved me out of. So today's message will be testimony of Bobby Butchasiamp. For those of you unsure, that's me, by the way. <clears throat> Today's message is going to be entitled, From Death to Life. From Death to Life. My name is Bobby Butchasiamp. How do you say that? Just don't. <laughs> I'm an associate pastor here at Sunrise Bible Church. A lot of you know me, some of you may not. I promise you that today you will know more about me than you'll ever want to know about anybody. I promise you. Today is going to be the story of how God took me from death to life from dark to light, from lies to truth, and from the world into the church, his church, which is the bride and the body of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. My life has not always been what it is today. My hope is that this message will encourage you all here today and also be instrumental in many souls coming to Christ here and around the world to the glory of God by the message of the gospel, which will be preached. But without further ado, let us go ahead and open our Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Some of you know exactly where I'm going with this. Ephesians chapter 2. Page 2,464 in my Bible, for those of you wondering and who have the same exact Bible with the same print as I do. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. We're just going to look at verses 1 through 3 right now. Please let us stand as we read God's holy word. Starting in verse one says this, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. That's our encouraging word for the day. You may be seated. <clears throat> this is kind of a tough passage to swallow because this passage leaves us with only one conclusion concerning the entire human race, and that is that we are dead, right? Did you guys get that from there too? Good, you guys are exegetes. You just exegeted that passage. Dead how? Well, dead in our trespasses and sins. That is, we are born in a way that is naturally at war with God and offensive to God. Because of the fall of Adam and Eve, all of humanity naturally enemies of God. It's our condition. Deal with it, right? I like what one guy says. He says, this passage is a sobering reminder of the total sinfulness and lostness from which sinners have been redeemed. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, 
The word in indicates the realm or sphere in which unregenerate sinners exist. They're not dead because of sinful acts that have been committed, but because of their sinful nature. As my, one of my mentors used to say, you're not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you're a sinner. The egg chicken thing, whatever. <clears throat> All the world walks in accordance with Satan and is under the control of the spirit of disobedience. <clears throat> From the time of our birth, we are cursed. From the beginning, we are sinners. From the womb to the tomb, we are depraved to the grave. All our deeds are wicked, no matter how good we might think we are. We are dead. We're children of wrath, and we are deserving of death and hell. The wages of sin is death. This is the condition of the entire human race. There is none good no, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all gone our own way and by nature want nothing to do with God and our enemies about God. <clears throat> Are we clear on that? Now that we're clear on that, let me tell you a little bit about me. Yay, same thing. Obviously, born a sinner in need of saving. In fact, I am a great sinner, uh, saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the Bible alone, all glory to God alone. Hallelujah, praise God, right? I was born in August 1975. Yeah, for those of you out there, I hear you. I know. Hey, he's young, hey, little kid. All right. I hear you. I know. I already hear you. In Granada Hills, California, my parents are Timothy and Marie Butchesiamp. I have an older sister, Sherry, who is 10 years older than me, and an older brother, Timmy, who is eight years older than me. Eight years after Timmy was born, my parents had me, and then two years later, they gave birth to my younger sister, Yvonne. Kind of two families going on there, right? <clears throat> Before my older sister, Sherry, was born, my mom gave birth to a son, who would have been named Timothy. He would have been the oldest of us all. He died a few months later due to uh, infection that was going around the hospital at that time. So he died. I, I can recall growing up, my mom and dad would always say he was watching over us, right? Looking down on us. And when he died, he got his wings and he was in heaven flying around apparently. And his mission was to look after us. Now, let me ask you, is that biblical? Is that unbiblical? Absolutely. Why? Because... Hebrews 9.27, simply put. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes the judgment, right? Scripture is always clear on these type of situations. Unfortunately, you look around in our world today, and what are they teaching you? Angels are coming back down to earth to do good deeds and help humans so they can earn their weight. Really? Hmm, interesting, right? This is some of the indoctrination, right? This is some of the indoctrination. Look, I know my parents meant well. Maybe this is how they dealt with their grief, their loss. Let me tell you something. I believe in an age of accountability. I believe in an age of innocence where babies who are innocent, who have not yet been, have the, the capability to intentionally sin, I believe they go to be with the Lord, right? I believe that and I believe it's biblical. So you tell me what's more encouraging that somehow he earned his wings or I know for certain biblically He's with God and I'll see him again. Did, did see what the world throws at us though? You see what we're up against? And I, I know they meant well, but again, that is wrong. From the earliest age I can remember, there was unbiblical indoctrination, which followed me through a lot of my life. And a lot of us here uh, under the same thing, grew up under these kind of teachings, these kind of beliefs, right? Especially if you grew up uh, with TV theology, you know, like we did. It was always right. <clears throat> We did not grow up in a Christian home. According to a worldly standard, though, you know, my parents, they were good parents. They did the best they could. They provided for us kids the best that they could, right? They worked hard. What must be understood, though, simply this is that there is no middle ground here, okay? You are either in Christ or you are already following the ways of Satan. There is no middle ground. I don't care how good you think it is. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And how many? No one comes to the Father but through me. No one. There is no way around this. There are no shortcuts. There is no way around. It is in Jesus and Jesus alone that there is salvation for the souls of mankind. Amen? No other way. It is what it is. There's no middle ground. Any other way is a deception and a false path. It is a broad road that leads straight to hell. Yes, I said the four-letter word, hell. We must understand there is no middle ground. Okay? You're either in Christ or you're outside of Christ, period. There's no gray area there. It's black and white, period. There's a narrow gate and a narrow path. These lead to life. There are only 
few who find it. I still remember one of my dear friends said to him the scariest word in the Bible was few. Of course, his heart was for evangelism. And when you're out there and you're evangelizing, you know that only few will even find the narrow gate, let alone walk the narrow path. Uh, there is a broad road as well that leads straight to hell, a broad gate and a broad road. It is a deception, okay? <clears throat> and these lead to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. So, look, we moved a lot uh, growing up. I moved from California, where I was born, to Washington State. Uh, my parents worked hard to take care of us kids. And because of this, we spent a lot of time with my older sister, again, 10 years older than me, my grandma, and, of course, my brother. They would look out, af they would look out after us uh, while my parents worked. So... Growing up, uh, we listened to a lot of different music. I say this because you're going to see the music had a huge part, played a huge role in my life uh, growing up, uh, big time, big time. And hopefully we're going to see that today. Uh, there was a lot of different music. Uh, of course, my parents like the oldies rock and all that stuff. My older brother and sister with the, at that time, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath was the heavier stuff. You know, then came like the Motorhead and all that other deeper, darker stuff. <clears throat> But this is what was brought into our home. And this was, again, foundational to the direction my life would go. Also, along with this was movies, right? You guys seen a lot of movies, right? Growing up, I remember when I was five years old, and for the first time in my life, I seen The Exorcist. Anybody else seen this movie? <clears throat> then you remember her? Five years old, freaked out. You remember this scene, Right? This is the types of stuff, and again, this is disturbing, so yes, please, if you, there's, there's more, they're even more disturbing, I'll, I'll keep you posted as we get there. <clears throat> My little sister and I were terrified, we were there with our parents and one of their friends on the couch, it was dark, and I remember when she started throwing up that green stuff, my dad just started laughing, this was funny to them, right? This was funny. Isn't it interesting that this is exactly how Satan wants us to respond to his reality as a real being, a real creature who's really evil and wants you dead. This is how we respond to him, right? It's just a movie. Mm, with all due respect, I think there's more to it than that. My little sister and I would not even walk down the hall to the bathroom without the other one there. And we would go to the bathroom. If the other one was not outside the door, there was no way. Wasn't doing it, right? We were just terrified, right? Now, this really set the stage for what would become my theology, right? This set the stage for what would become my view of God. Did you know that everybody in the world has a form of theology? They have a view of God, whether it's biblical and good and solid or whether it's not. There is a view of God in everybody's hearts and minds. So this set the stage for how I would view God. If you recall in the movie, the two Catholic priests that could not cast this demon out. Do you remember? They came out, they were sweating, right? They could not cast out this demon. What did this demon say? We are legion for we are many. At the end of the movie, if you recall, the demon had moved from the girl into the younger priest, right? And then he jumped out the window committing suicide. Yes! Woo! Right? Where's the hope? This is a supposed man of God, a representation of God's man in this situation, and there's no hope. He committed suicide. So what do we do? Well, at five years old, this is what I was worried about. These were the things in my heart. This was what was going on, right? <clears throat> I had swung the pendulum far left in my fear and awe of Satan. I knew that this could happen to me and that there was nothing I could do about it. My older sister would practice witchcraft in her room. She used to make the flames in the fireplace go higher by staring at them. How real was this? I remember this. I seen this with my own eyes. How real was it? I don't know. Could I surely say? I mean, we were right there. I remember one time at one of her birthday parties, she had a lot of people over. <clears throat> Some of the people she went to high school with later on became known as grunge guys, Chris Cornell. Those people were her friends up in Washington where we lived. <clears throat> she had a birthday party and she stared into a strobe light until she started going into seizures and passed out, freaking out. So hey, this was the stuff we grew up with. This was normal, right? This is normal. <clears throat> My parents would have parties with their coworkers. They would come to the house. They would be drinking and smoking marijuana. You know, I remember watching my mom smoke the bong. You know, some of you guys, these were the good old days, right? 
<clears throat> kids that come up, they're wearing your hat, they're drinking your beer, you know, you're smoking weed around them, hey, blowing in their face, you're watching them, you're laughing. This is how we grew up. And again, my parents, please, they, they did the best they could. This is what was going on. This is the world we live in. This is normal to the world's standards. You guys with me? <clears throat> well, it didn't take long until this just escalated completely out of control. Again, you open the door for Satan and you open it all the way. At least in my life and my little sisters. With my parents gone so much, my little sister and I both fell prey to sexual perversion within our own home. The shame haunted me for years, made me even question my own sexuality at times growing up. In fact, my sister is 43 years old and with a girl and obviously not saved. She's a lesbian. <clears throat> Pray for her. This was the opening of the floodgate. And I remember a couple other things at this time, ages five and six. You guys familiar with nettles? Do you know what those are? We were on a nature hike in Washington State, and I rolled down a hill. You know, it's like a poison ivy. Po These are nettles, very small needles. My whole body was burning from head to toe as if being stabbed with hot needles. I had to sit in a bath for three hours. Along with this, uh, we had a cousin of ours staying with us and his girlfriend from New York. And uh, we found out that she was huffing spray paint. We found out, I found out the hard way. My little sister found the can, threw it in the back of the fireplace. My brother lit the fire, didn't clean it out thoroughly. And there I was feeding paper into the fire, just mesmerized by the heat and the flames. And all of a sudden, boom, blew up in my face. Third degree burns all over my face, burned all my hair off. I was in the hospital for a week, wrapped like a mummy. Um, they had me on a lot of stuff. I remember I was pretty high in the hospital. They had me on some stuff for pain. So anyway, this is the kind of stuff that w took place. Moreover, on top of all this, we moved a lot. Again, I was born in California, moved to Washington State around the age of three, lived there for a few years until about six. Then we moved across state to Rochester, New York. We're there for two years and then landed in Vegas around the age of eight. So we moved a lot. <clears throat> I remember when we moved here, we lived in a motel off of Nellis and uh, Lake Mead area. It was called Stevens Motel at the time, way back when. That whole area was desert. And uh, my mom and dad were selling weed. You know, they were trying to make it. We had eight people living in a one-bedroom motel. And us kids had the closet. There was like four kids sleeping in a big closet. Again, they did the best they could, right? We were survivors, gypsies, but we were survivors. We did what we could. I remember the, uh, <clears throat> my mom's dealer just left after dropping off weed, and she gets a call from him. He heard on his scanner that the cops were coming to the house. Somebody tipped us off about the weed and the gun. So they went out the back window by my brother's hands, and then the cops uh, were going to kick down the door. You know, mom opened it. They came in, explained everything. They left. Uh, again, this is eight years old, this kind of stuff that I remember going on. Drugs were always a part of our life. This time, though, was a time when I had my first bout with depression. I was eight years old. I was in the third grade and would sit in class feeling like the weight of the world was on me. It's just like I was getting ready to explode inside. Eventually, I would just lay my head down and cry as quiet as I could in class. About the same time every day. It took about two weeks. The teacher caught on to what was going on. She sent me down to the... Uh, psychologist's office. He asked me a bunch of questions and the conclusion was I was suffering from manic depression. <clears throat> this continued for some time and then we moved again. Things were looking a little bit better. We moved into a house in North Las Vegas. Uh, again, things were looking up around eight, nine years old. I remember I took my first bong hit. It was with my brother's friends down the street. Man, I was on one. I couldn't stop smiling, right? It was just Bad. I remember hearing about my cousin that he was selling cocaine. So again, eight, nine years old, and this was normal. I remember one time my brother was rolling a joint and he sprinkled this white stuff. I ran out in the backyard crying. I was just, a, mom, 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 there's poison in that. Don't do it. She's like, oh, honey, it's okay. Don't worry, as they sat and smoked this joint in front of me. It was just terrifying. What is going on? Needless to say, growing up with all this, I started to rebel we had moved a few more times. By the time I was 13, I was listening to all kinds of music, rock music, metal music, rap music. I mean, all kinds of music. Again, music was I reverted to for, for comfort, for whatever, right? It was music. I was well overweight at 200 pounds, and uh, my dad at this time sold movies. You guys remember VHS and Beta? And he was like the first guy at the swap meet that sold movies. Well, of course, he had a box of pornographic films. He sold them, and I snuck into them and watched them at 13 years old. I was struggling with 
weight loss, I was struggling with weight, I was struggling with an identity crisis, I was failing in school, failed the seventh grade. It wasn't because I was stupid, it was because I just didn't care. Uh, the father of all lies had a foothold in my house and in my heart, right? And on my family. And of course, we moved again by age 14. Uh, some of you are familiar with Clark High School, Silver Dollar area, age 14, I lived over there. Uh, this is when I really started rebelling. Um, got in with some uh, Donna Street Crips who were selling crack and gangbanging and drinking. And I would stay up late with them. This is what I learned. I was listening to uh, Scarface and the Ghetto Boys, which is very, very horrible rap music. They rap about all kinds of stuff. They rap about gangbanging, selling crack, fornication, all kinds of things. So, you know, going from introvert, what I became, to now I'm starting to come out, I just exploded eventually. I ran away from home at this time to hang out late night and sell crack and drink beer. Went on for a couple weeks, and then I returned home. We moved again. During this time, um, 14 years old was when I got arrested for the first time, and I was arrested on some felony charges, breaking and entering, vandalism and theft, and uh, uh, misuse of uh, chemical or something. Kid came by, and we were walking to school, and we ended up at another kid's house, broke into his window, and stayed there huffing rubber cement. Well, I broke into the rest of the house and started stealing stuff, found spray paint. We were huffing spray paint, too. I went and got me a grocery cart and filled it with all my new precious possessions. I went home, hooking up the speakers I found and stole. Later that night, here come the cops with the kid in the back of the car. Cop came up to the door, knocked. My mom came to my room. Cops are here for you. Cop says, are you William Butchesiap? I said, yes, sir. He says, you're under arrest. I went out of that house with pride in my heart. You with me? Yes. My mom was in tears. I was just like, yeah, get it, right? I was starting to come out of my shell, and when I did, it was nothing nice. Age 15, I was getting into heavier metal music, experimenting with LSD. It had been smoking crack, smoking weed. We moved again, got into skateboarding, was listening to punk music. I had a mohawk that was this tall, black eyeliner, black nails, and just rebelling at every which way you could rebel. I, everything, just so filled with hatred. I was coming out of my shell. At this time, though, after this, I discovered death metal. When I discovered death metal, I, it was like I was in heaven, hell. With me? Heaven, hell. It was the hardest, the heaviest music there was. It was about death and murder and Satanism. The groups I listened to were very satanic. One of my favorite groups at this time was called Deicide. It comes from the Latin, which means killing God. Deicide, pure evil. This is one of the pictures I found. It's just a patch. Simply, you can see the three upside-down crosses, the three uh, upside-down pentagrams. Again, satanic symbolism. I'm not even going to get into explaining this one, but you can see it's very uh, graphic, very dark. And this was a live concert they did, When Satan Lives. This is where I was at in my heart. Very dark. Very dark. These guys were like a satanic worship. They... They sang worship music to Satan, right? Their concerts were like a satanic ritual. Just very, just evil. That's where I was at. That's where my heart was. These guys were everything that was anti-God and anti-Christ. Again, their music was like a big satanic ritual. They're singing worship music to Satan. And I loved it because it was fulfilling to me. It was everything that made me feel alive. There was another one of my favorites was called Cannibal Corpse. Now, this one's very graphic. This image is, is very graphic. This was one of my favorite albums for the longest time. This is actually a, a based on a true story about a guy by the name of Baron Gills de Rise, who, what he did was he documented killing pregnant women and tearing their babies out of their stomachs. It's a real story, uh, I think, in the 1800s about this guy. Again, I'm not encouraging this by any means. I want you to know where my heart was at. It was very dark, very dark.
this wasn't bad enough, things just kept getting worse. <clears throat> Started praying to Satan. Basically gave my life over to evil and to completely oppose everything that was God. I figured that Satan was to be feared. Everybody feared him. So I was going to serve him and I was going to terrify this world. And I was going to get back what was mine. I shook my fist at God. God, you had your chance and you failed. By the way, God never fails. I said, if you were so good, then why has all this bad stuff happened to me, God? And in my ignorance, I turned my life over to Satan completely. Or so I thought. Remember, there is no middle ground here. I was already on the path to hell. I just made a conscious decision in my darkened heart to serve Satan. You guys with me? Age 16, I got into LSD real heavy, was experimenting with Robitussin as well. If you guys are familiar with that, cough medicine, whatever. Again, not encouraging this. Then came methamphetamines. I was introduced to my dream drug. I started doing meth heavily, and eventually by age 17, I was shooting heroin. That went on for about six months, the first time at age 17. I've kicked heroin probably about five or six times in my whole life. At age 17, the first time it went on for about six months. Then in a suicidal state of mind, I called my parents, needed money for heroin. They ended up coming down and picking me up from downtown. They brought me home. I kicked heroin with the help of meth. Since I had already been introduced to the needle intravenously to shooting up, that became my way of doing drugs. Again, this went on for years. It was always something and most of the time more than one drug. Heroin and Sherm, right? For those of you who don't know, Sherm is a liquid form of PCP that you dip like cigarettes and things into smoke. It was meth and Sherm. It was heroin, crack and Sherm. It was meth and pills. One wasn't enough. I was so dark and so empty that it was just, it was consuming. One thing wasn't enough anymore. It was as much as I can get to not have to feel the pain of life. <clears throat> By age 18, I went to jail for the first time, real jail. Big guy jail. I got caught shoplifting. Of course, this was part of my life. And the officer wanted to teach me a lesson. He could have let me go for shoplifting. But because I was 18, he says, you know, you're young. I'm going to teach you. I'm going to teach you a lesson, young man. Uh, little did he know that he was about to introduce me into what would become my second home. In fact, the lifestyle I lived, uh, 330 South Casino Center Boulevard was the only address I kept for six months or more at a time. For those of you not familiar, here's a picture of it outside there. You have the North Tower and South Tower. Brian will take you on a tour if you'd like. Uh, here's the front there, Clark County Detention Center. Uh, I've been all through that place. 21 years of my life, in and out, in and out, in and out. But this behavior, this lifestyle went on for a long time, in and out of jail all the time for shoplifting, for drugs, for paraphernalia, for selling drugs, etc., it just kept getting worse and worse. I had become a full-time criminal to support my drug habit. My drug habit got worse, as did my criminal behavior. I was a dirtbag who hated God and pretty much most people. As far as I was concerned, the world owed me, God owed me, and all of you owed me. So that when I stole your stuff, it wasn't stealing, just rightful pay for all that I had to go through growing up. And of course, blame my parents as well on the road right? Isn't this the attitude of today? Isn't this what's going on? I was shooting meth daily, selling drugs. I got into cooking meth. That was fun. No, it wasn't. I'm just kidding. Um, gambled heavily, you know, everything. Look where, look where we are, Sin City. Look at this place, right? Everything your sinful nature desires is right at your fingertips here. Isn't it crazy? Isn't it crazy? Going in and out of jail so much, though. This went on for 21 years of my life, right? It went on from the age of 14 on, but from the age of 17 when I started shooting to the age of 37, basically 38 um, was, was the same thing. Going in and out of jail so much, I did become familiar with the Bible, though. I would get arrested and get a Bible and start reading, you know? I would go to the Bible studies they had in jail. People would come in and share scripture. They would share encouraging stories about this Jesus and, and about life so wonderful. You know, I wanted that. I did. I wanted that bad. 
but I didn't want that bad enough. You want to know why? I wanted to add some of that to what I already had going on in hopes that what I had going on would be better. You with me? The gospel is not an addition to a condition. It is taking something that is dead and making it alive. It's not fixing what's already broken. It's making it new. That's what the gospel does. I would get excited about what I was learning in the Bible. I would write my mom how I was changed. Just so you know, around this time of my life, the, 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 my mom was worried to death about me. Um, her greatest moments, as she told me later, were when she would get a letter from me from jail. She knew I was alive, and she knew I was well. That was, those were the things that encouraged her. So I'd write my mom a letter. Mom, I'm doing better. I'm changed. Woohoo! praise God, right? Get out of jail. I had a Bible in this hand and a syringe full of meth over in this arm. <clears throat> About a week later, I couldn't find that Bible. Through this period of time, obviously a lot happened, but there's some pictures I found from around this time period. That's me there on the far left, uh, this guy here. That's my older sister, Sherry, my younger sister, Yvonne, my, my older brother, Timmy, um, my sister actually got married at this time to a guy, lasted about a week, and then that was it. And then here's me and my sister again. I'm the cool-looking, goatee-looking freak with the guitar. Uh, that's me there and my sister. So there's some pictures of the past there. And again, this lifestyle went on for 21 years. In 2010, I made my first appearance in the big time. Yeah, and we're not talking about Hollywood either. That's right. High Desert State Prison. For those of you who don't know, there's another picture there of the facility. Um, got arrested, of course, and there it was. Uh, went, to, went to jail for attempted possession of a vehicle, uh, attempted possession of a stolen vehicle. So uh, interesting. I was sentenced to 12 to 34 months, ended up at the camp up there in High Desert, uh, TLVCC. You know what? I became the prep cook in the kitchen. I was working out every day. Uh, I didn't mind this at all. This had structure. I was good. You know what I mean? I had some structure. I had a program. I had a set schedule. Uh, got out about 11 months, and the same day, my friends came, picked me up. There I was smoking meth again. Again, uh, interesting story. This was me at that time, fresh out of prison. I know it's kind of hard to see. I've got the shaved head with the goatee and just the, looking for something to smash because I was about 250 pounds of solid, and I was ready to go. I was ready to hit the streets again. That was my life. By the year 2000, <clears throat> I had hit my lowest point ever. I started having pain in my side. My right side right here. And five different times in the month of June, 2012, I was taken to four different hospitals. The first four times they let me go. They kept me for a little while. They put me on the bag and everything, rehydrated. Uh, you're good to go. Uh, we don't really like you. Uh, you meth head, get out. The last time they kept me, it was at St. Rose up there off of Lake Mead Parkway. Uh, come to find out, I was dying. Apparently, I had done it now. Everything... Uh, Everything had finally caught up to me. Here I was, 37 years old, with cirrhosis of the liver, gallstones, hep C, jaundice, and I had a right front inguinal hernia. I was out cold for the first 24 to 36 hours, and uh, when I woke up, I was informed that I had been on my deathbed. Basically, the doctor was just waiting for my body to shut down and die. That's where I was at. I stayed in the hospital for a week and then was moved to a corridor with two other guys in recovery unit. I was there for a couple of days. One of the guys had a chaplain come in. You know, I always remember those times when somebody reached out to me with the truth of God's word. Do you remember those times before you got saved? It was, oh, wow, that person, this person, you know, this chaplain that prayed with me in the hospital and gave me a Bible and all these things. Do you know that everybody in hell will remember those same people as well? When you're in hell, you are going to remember every time somebody came to you with the gospel and it's going to burn in your mind. Not... You know, literally, it's going to burn in you. I remember those times, though, this time right here. And there I was again at that crossroad, that fork in the road. Well, a week after my release, I got in an argument with my girlfriend at that time. And there I was once again with a needle in my arm. I left her, went back with an ex-girlfriend because she sold heroin and meth. And there I was shooting both again. No concern for my own life. I'd come really close to death. And there I was, like nothing ever happened. Guys, I didn't really want to die. I just didn't care to live. You with me? It had become so empty and so dark. And there I was, just feeding my darkened soul everything it loves. Needless to say, this had become very painful. Still dying. The pain was excruciating. It was, uh, 
my intestines would fall down through my inguinal tract. When your intestines, they, uh, anyway, strangulate is the term. Um, it shot me to the ground in, in tears and in sweat. Also, my liver was failing. I was turning yellow. All this was going on, uh, still going on. Five months later, I was off of Maryland Parkway at a house. Now, the house inside was mostly empty. Nobody actually lived there, lived there. But the people that did live there had their stuff in the pool house in the back. So me, being who I was, I found this. And the third time I was there, in the pool house in the back, stealing their stuff, I was during the day. And I should have known the dog next door kept barking, barking, barking. Got a weird feeling, so I go around and I look, and there's Metro out there. So I went back in. Of course, my girlfriend at the time was inside there. We both ended up getting arrested that day. I think it's funny in some of those times that, you know, the cop tells a joke about two kids in this town. And anyway, you know, uh, they, they say, they, uh, where's God? Where's God? Where's God? The kid runs back and says, somebody stole God, and they think we did it. Anyway, these stories that you get, these, these encounters with some of these officers, just crazy. But this was one of those encounters, right? At this time, though, I was already out on intensive supervision, if those of you know who that is. Once a week, I had to go down to county and do fingerprints at a kiosk for a burglary charge. And here I was with a breaking, entering, theft, burglary charge, right? I thought for sure that I would be back out in no time. That was not the case. Not the case at all. I spent three days sleeping in a chair in front of the nurse's station in intake before I went to the fourth floor, which was medical. They kept me in this chair to make sure I didn't die because I was out because I was dying, right? I was high risk. And I'm thinking, I got this high risk. They ain't going to keep me. I'm out. I'll be out in no time. Not the case. That's not how it worked. I was in the fourth floor a week. After that, I was in a regular unit. Still remember, two king. I would have these moments where it was just an excruciating pain um, from, from everything still. Still dying from cirrhosis of the liver. Still issues with my gallbladder. Still turning yellow from time to time from the jaundice. I had no intention on becoming a Christian. I remember sitting in the holding tanks talking about praising Satan and batching dope to one guy. This is what we were talking about. Yeah, I did this. I got this. No worries. Pride in my heart, right? I had no intention on becoming a Christian, but praise God, that decision wasn't up to me. When Jesus Christ saves you, he does what only he can do through the Holy Spirit who tears out your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh a heart that can respond to God. Like this passage, Ezekiel eleven nineteen says, and I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Also Ezekiel 36, 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. If you were to ask me, how does salvation work? I would say this passage is right here, is a good illustration. God literally rips out your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. He gives you a heart that can respond to him, a heart that can hear the gospel and believe it is true, a heart that can know you have sinned against a holy and righteous God and a heart that can bring you to a place of repentance. That's what God does. That's what only God can do. I can't convince you in any which way. You know what I can do? I can give you the gospel and let God do what only he can do. That's what God does to wretched, miserable people like us. <clears throat> so here I am sitting in jail after speaking to my court-appointed attorney, found out that I was now definitely habitual. Literally two felonies in less than two months. Uh, this wasn't looking too good. I was looking at five to 20 years, one to four years, and 19 to 48 months for a grand total of seven and a half years minimum and possible 28 years maximum. There was no, uh, this was bow-legged, not consecutive. There was no consecutive on this, no deal to be made here. This is what my life had come to. 37 years old, dying from liver failure, looking at spending a lot of time in the prison system. I wasn't worried about prison, you know that? I liked it up there. Right? Not for any weird reason. I liked it because it was, it was just something I missed in my life. Work in the kitchen. Hey, get me a job. Whatever. The thing that affected me the most. 
that had the biggest impact on me that I was empty inside. And I had been for a long time, literally my whole life, right? I was empty inside. This is the nature of the human condition. Ephesians 2, 1 and 2. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. What's the result of this? In which you formerly walked, this is a constant habitual conduct. According to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, i.e. Satan, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. I was dead and I knew it. I, it just didn't add up. Now that my head was cleared up again, I realized that my life was meaningless. I was pretty broken up over that and many other things as well. Grateful that I was able to realize this truth. This was God enabling me for the first time to see my sinfulness, my wretchedness. I mean, not only apart from the bad news of, hey, you could be, could be doing a lot of prison time. My best friend was at my house with my girlfriend. Just, just saying, this is the world we live in, guys. This is what was going on in there. Man, I was, I was pretty broken up over this. Pretty broken up. But for the first time in my life, I understood the difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow, right? This was God enabling me to see, tearing out my heart of stone, giving me a heart of flesh, allowing me a godly sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Two kinds of sorrow. Let me tell you something, man. Time and time again, I was sorry, all right, right? Sorry I got caught. Dang it. Now I'm gonna miss out on all the fun and the things and I'm gonna lose all my stuff again. I even regretted the way I treated people, right? My head cleared up. I remember how I did people. I remember I was wrong in a lot of ways. I was sorry for those things. I was pretty much a sorry mess who was only concerned with himself. But this time was different. This time I was sorry but the sorrow was because I knew that it was God whom I sinned against. Nobody else, nothing else. It was God who I needed to pray and seek forgiveness. It was God who I needed to go to. And this is the conclusion I believe David came to. Psalm 51, 4. Against you, God, you only I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you, God, are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. I sinned against God, and for the first time in my life, I knew this. Now was my come to Jesus meeting, as some would say. This was the moment for me. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus speaking. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. John 6, 37, Jesus speaking. He says this, all that the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. This is the truth of Scripture, the truth of the gospel. This is the truth. So what happened to me? That's a good question. Turn back with me in your Bibles to Ephesians. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 2. Starting at verse 1 says this. <clears throat> and you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. What's those first two words in verse four? Let's say it together. But God. Let's say that again. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. By grace you have been saved. What happened to me? That's what happened to me. Simply put, I was dead. Incapable of responding to God in any which way. Headed to hell. Hater of God. God gave me life. What happened to me? God took a dead thing and made it alive. 
But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, made me alive together with Christ. I was given a new heart, a renewed mind, and a new life. I was raised from death to life. <clears throat> this is salvation. God makes dead things alive. Praise God. Romans 5.8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, <clears throat> Christ died for us. He did what only he can do. What happened to me? I got saved. God saved me. I started going to the Bible studies there in the unit. <clears throat> Became really close with the guys who brought the Bible study into the jail. Tim Behrens, Clegg Seth, John Labrada, dear brothers of mine. Still very close brothers to this day. I remember one of the studies, a guy, uh, Mike, brought in a DVD in his uh, laptop. And they used to let, they, yeah, back in the day, they used to let you do that. <clears throat> and we were in the little room in the unit. And he brought this testimony in. Can anybody guess what DVD he brought in? Pastor Billy's testimony. <laughs> and I was like, wow, amazing. <clears throat> it took me three months to finally make it to Sunrise Bible Church. But when I did make it, I stayed. <clears throat> I got released from jail. Things were not easy at all, especially given the situation that I was in. But God, let me ask you something. Did Jesus Christ promise you easy? Promised you a cross to die on, right? And an eternity with him. What more do you need? I was still sick, going to the doctors every month and sometimes twice a month. Finally got my hernia surgery. All went well with that. Praise God. <clears throat> Two weeks later, I had to go for some blood draw. Of course, concerning hep C, uh, cirrhosis of the liver. They were going to try to find a, you know, whatever, some sort of, there was some experimental drugs in for hep C. <clears throat> they took 10 vials of blood. I went back two weeks later. The doctor could not believe what he was seeing. Came in the room and he opened his folder and he was just baffled. I, I don't know what to tell you. I've never seen anything like this. There are no traces of hep C in your blood. <clears throat> Cirrhosis of the liver, what are you talking about? I was literally, they wanted me to get on a, a list for a liver transplant. They wanted to remove my gallbladder and I needed to get on some medication for hep C. This is where I was at. Uh, look, God is still healer today. God is healer, okay? God is the worker of miracles. Anytime somebody gets saved, that is miraculous, okay? Don't ever attribute that to any man. There are none of those today. God is the one who does this. And it wasn't because I did anything. It's just like my salvation. You know what my prayer was? <laughs> God, I'm sick and I'm dying, but if I die, I'm going to die for you. But God, if you decide to heal me, I'm going to live for you. Help me to live for you. Not my will, your will be done. That's where it's at. <clears throat> it was as if I had never been sick to begin with. Praise God, right? I got plugged in at Sunrise Bible Church and became part of the internship here. Actually, we were the ground floor, if you will, we started with four guys, and at one time, we had 10 interns here. That's uh, up at the top picture, Oz there, me, Pastor Billy, Joey, and Robert. And then the bottom picture there, I won't go through all that, but that's, this is what the internship was like at one point in time, and Lord willing, building it up again, because there are men here, I believe, who God has called to serve him at the capacity that God has called me to serve him and Pastor Billy to serve him, and we want to train you for that. This is the internship here. It wasn't long after that <clears throat> that I started Bible college. I finished up my diploma in Christian ministries within four years. I was working, serving here, going to school a couple nights a week. Uh, but also, one of the cool things, you know when you start to see the Bible work, you know, unravel in your life? You start to see like the promises of God unfold. Like, wow, God gave me this new family, this, this church family. You know, if anybody forsakes father or mother, man, you know, all these promises. Now I was ready for this promise. And uh, praise God, I actually met my beautiful wife, Deborah, who actually said yes. <clears throat> of course, this was before she heard my testimony. <laughs> I remember our first real date. We went to see that movie, The War Room, together. You know, it had been going on for a year. Carly and I and us, we were praying for her and, you know, whatever. And finally went to lunch one day. We went to the war room on our first date. 
on the way to dropping her off at home, <clears throat> I looked over and I was like, so, uh, you know, we should do like some couples counseling or something. And she's like, did you just propose to me? Did you just ask me to marry you? I'm like, well, I guess. I mean, you know, <laughs> pretty much. And three months later, of course, by God's grace, uh, we were able to get married. <clears throat> they did, we did the thing where they blind, you know, walked us with our eyes closed to a corner. Each one around the corner got to hold hands and pray together before the wedding. Of course, that's us again. You know, we we're just all spoofed out, whatever. And there's Pastor Billy taking it very serious as he does. Uh, but that's Pastor Billy for you. <clears throat> So I started Bible college, but also went to school. See, I had dropped out in the eighth grade. And to further my education in seminary, I had to get, uh, have at least my GED. So I took some night classes, math, math, whatever, math. <laughs> anyway, so I needed to take some classes to learn some of the math. So I did that. And then I prepared, and that's me, Dorkology 101. Um, <laughs> getting ready to graduate for, with my GED. <clears throat> Along with all this, I was serving at Sunrise Bible Church as an intern while going to Bible college. I got to fill in many times for Pastor Billy on Wednesdays and Sundays, uh, teaching and preaching while training for ministry. This is one of the pictures of teaching or preaching or whatever I was doing. I don't remember. Also graduated Bible college, and there I am again, and my wife, and we got to travel to California, and it was pretty cool, you know, a good event, and pretty cool stuff, pretty cool stuff. I was also uh, given the ability to preach at other churches while uh, filling in for their pastors while they were out of town. Uh, preached at Red Rock, uh, Red Rock Baptist Church, also a church in Dolan Springs. It was kind of an interview because they were looking for a pastor. So we were driving to Dolan Springs on Sunday to go there and fill in. Uh, they gave me six weeks. At the end of that six weeks, they were glad I was gone and never wanted to see me again. <laughs> and I didn't even have the guy that was filling in call me and say, oh, I can't believe what? Because you have women in the church that are leading the church, really? And then hanging out with the Mormons and Catholics down the street, praying together as if this is okay? What does darkness have to do with light? Well, anyway, in love, obviously. You, know, you can't, how can you walk away from that? When God has called you to this, no, you have to be faithful to God first and foremost. So <clears throat> after all that, we uh, uh, had this opportunity in Pahrump, um and went out there and interviewed for them. They were like, oh, we love you. <laughs> you got to come out here. So we did. We, I quit my job, Deb and I, and she quit hers. We left. We moved out there to move on to the Parsonage. Four and a half months later, hijacked the service, and you guys got to go. Really? Uh, but anyway, this was the ordination service at Sunrise Bible Church, part of it. You know, there's me and my wife, of course, Pastor Billy, all the elders and stuff came up and laid hands on me. And it was really cool uh, to go off like that. But, <clears throat> you know, in uh, four and a half months, uh, it, it, Man, the church is in a bad way. That's what we got to learn from that. And praise God, we were able to plant the church uh, there with the help of Sunrise Bible Church. And uh, my, we were thinking about what name. And my wife remembered a sermon I did on Matthew 7, 13 and 14. And she's like, we should call it the Narrow Gate Bible Church. And so we did. This was the building there in Pahrump, <clears throat> right behind Tractor Supply. Now you had all the billboard stuff up. And then, uh, of course, Narrow Gate Bible Church. It was the name of the church. We're not talking about the wrought iron bars there. <laughs> it, it's narrow, but <clears throat> not that narrow. We labored there for a year, prayerfully seeking God's will. Ended up back at Sunrise Bible Church to serve with Pastor Billy. Uh, serving you all here as an associate pastor. Serving in the teaching ministry. Uh, with a new membership class and serving in assimilation that is getting you guys plugged in for service. I don't know about you, uh, but I would definitely say that is a huge difference from what my life was like to what it is now. All glory to God. <clears throat> John 10.10, 10, we know the thief, i.e. Satan, comes to kill only to kill, to steal and to kill and to destroy. This is what he does. This is where my life was before Christ. But what does Jesus say? I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And I don't know about you, but there's nothing more abundant than eternal life in Jesus Christ, right? I can honestly say I didn't know life until Jesus Christ. He saved a wretch like me. He saved me of all the dirtiest, nastiest, shameful, wicked, perverse, pitifully pathetic, miserable, and wretched people in the world. God saved me. I think that's pretty amazing. All for his glory, according to his mercy, by his grace, grace through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, God saved me. 
amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh God, we thank you for your amazing grace. Maybe you're sitting here today though, and still a bit skeptical. Maybe your thoughts are something like this, and I've heard this before. Well, I'm glad that works for you. Have you heard that before? I'm glad that works for you. If this is you, then please listen close. The gospel is the good news. It is God's good news given through his son, Jesus Christ, to a lost and dying world that needs redeemed. This is the gospel. The gospel is about how Jesus Christ came to take your penalty on himself at the cross. This is what Jesus did. Because God is holy, 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 and we are not. Because God is perfect holiness and we are not. Something had to be done in order to fulfill that, what we could not do, and to make us right again with God, right? God is holy. He demands perfection. Who here can offer God what he demands? Nobody, right? Who did offer God a sacrifice that he will take? Jesus Christ, right? Was the only sacrifice in our place that was worthy of God. When Jesus Christ came and died on the cross, he appeased the wrath of God and appeased the anger of God by himself. He came into this world born of a virgin, the perfect man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ pleased God the Father by his perfect and sinless life. Jesus Christ then went to the cross on our behalf, taking the full cup of God's wrath on himself in our place. Look, man, you're not just in a bad way. Life didn't just do you a bad hand. If you are not in Christ, you're under the wrath of God, period. There's no middle ground, none at all. The Bible says he made him who knew no sin to be the sin offering on our behalf, that because of this, we could now become the righteousness of God in him. God took our sin and placed it in Christ's account on the cross. He took Christ's perfect righteousness, placed it in our account. Do you see the exchange? This is what God did. He did this on behalf of us through Jesus Christ. John 6, 37, Jesus says, for all that the father gives me will come to me and the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. John 6, 40 says, this is the will of my father, Jesus speaking, that everyone who beholds the son and believes in him will have eternal life. And I myself, Jesus says, will raise him up on the last day. This is the truth of scripture. This is the message communicated. This is the good news. But there's bad news. Did you know that? I think we dealt with that today. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. How many is all? All, right? Is there any exceptions? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, not even one. Back to Ephesians 2, 1, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. The wages of sin is death. So what, right? So what? Well, Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God's not a big meanie. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. All for who believe. John 1, 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. They were born again. You must be born again. John 3, 3, Jesus said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You with me so far? All good stuff, right? So what? So what? So what must I do is the question. Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is more than just, oh yeah, I've heard it before. I believe it's there, whatever, whatever. One must believe he is who he claimed to be. You must believe that Jesus is the Christ. Jesus means God is salvation, right? His earthly name, Christ is Messiah God's anointed. God sent salvation through his anointed savior. That's Jesus Christ. With me? 
You must believe he is who he claimed to be and you must believe in what he did. 1 Corinthians 15, three and four. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Do you believe that he died for your sins? Do you believe that he was buried? <clears throat> Do you believe that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures? And because he lives, we have life in him. If you are in him, do you truly believe? Last time I checked, this is good news. This is the gospel. The gospel is God's message to a lost and dying world that there is hope through his son, Jesus Christ, who is the only hope. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Stop fighting with this. Would you please give in to the Holy Spirit's prompting on your heart? And give in to him. There is life abundant for those who will call upon the name of Jesus Christ and receive him as their Lord and Savior. This is you. Would you please do that today? I wish there was something I can do to make it more clear, but this is the gospel, and only the Holy Spirit can bring it into your heart as truth and change you. My prayer is that he would do that to you today if this is you. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the message, the good news of the gospel, God, that you show us your character, Lord, as a loving father who gave his only begotten son to a miserable, depraved, wicked, decrepit world of sinners who had nothing but hatred towards you, Lord. In all that, while we were enemies, your enemies, God, Christ died for the ungodly. That's me. He died for me. Oh God, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you for so much for your amazing grace that by your mercy, Lord, I can receive grace through faith in Christ to be saved. And anybody here, Lord, please, anybody here that does not truly know you as Lord and Savior, please would you do with them what only you can do as you did with me in the darkness of my heart you made me alive in Christ. Please, God, pray, Lord, that you would bear much fruit with this message today, be it encouraging to many, and God, use it in a mighty way to bring souls to Jesus through the gospel. Father, we love you and praise you and thank you. We lift this prayer to you in Jesus' name. And all God's